Hello, hello. Welcome to our live stream. It's Ned from Caspio. Uh, if you're able to hear me, please let me know so that we can begin today's uh, live stream session. We have a live build of the application today. Like before, hey, stability. Good to see you. Welcome back. So today's, I'm approximating today's live stream might take about 45 to 50 minutes because we're going to build about nine data pages. I'm not going to build all the tables. The tables are already created. We're not going to build the authentication. Um, and then I have some triggers that are already pre-built, but I will go through them and explain uh, how they were set up. Hey, Steven, welcome back. I appreciate it. Thank you. So as always, I like to give you a live example of the app so that you know exactly what we plan on developing. And then we're going to go into Caspio and build it out. So imagine you have a corporate facing website and on your website, your team has decided, hey, we need to have some public facing events and we want people and attendees to sign up for these events. So typically you would have it maybe a company drop down and under company, you might see an events link. So when you click on that link, you're going to be able to see a list of all the events. This is using Caspio's grid layout or gallery layout to display all the events. Uh, we do have some HTML and CSS. We'll be talking about that as well to lay out the data the way we want. You can see I have an icon here before the location and the date of the event. And then once you click on the event details, you're going to go into the details page to see more info. And from here, we can sign up for the event using a very simple modal, which we covered in the past. And now all the attendees, if they wish to attend that event, they can sign up, hit submit. And then on the back end, as an admin level user, we have a simple portal where we can manage all the events. So here's a listing of all of our public facing events. Uh, we can see which ones are published. We also have a capacity, meaning how many attendees can sign up for that event. Uh, so we set that capacity as the admin, and then we can see and count how many attendees have signed up for that event. There are some triggers that are happening here. So once that, once that capacity is met, let's say 20 out of 20, uh, we are going to unpublish that event so it's no longer visible on the front end. And we don't want more people to sign up for the event if, uh, if the event is already full. Um, we can also remove attendees. And when you remove the attendee, uh, the event it will once again be published and then somebody else can sign up for that event. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? So we can go into details uh, of each event. Um, so if I go into this one, I can edit the details of that event and I can see all of the attendees that have signed up. So it's a one to many. Uh, we can also manage attendees. So I can see the title of the event. I can see who signed up for the event and I can remove the uh, attendee from that event if they decided to cancel. Um, and then if you, by doing so, you have a trigger that's subtracting the attendee from the capacity count. So that way more people can sign up. And last but not least, we can create a new event as the admin. So if I wanted to publish something new to the website, I can submit the form, check to publish, include an image. And as you can see, I have, in my style, I have disabled my submit button here. I should have the submit button visible here, but just imagine you have a button that you can submit. And when you do that, you will be able to see that event listed right over here. Okay, simple app. Nine data pages, nothing too complicated except for HTML and CSS. And we have some triggers in the back end that are firing to um, automate some of these procedures. Let me know if you have any questions before we begin. Um, I definitely know we're not going to take a full hour today because it's only nine data pages. Last week we built an application that had 15 data pages, so we went over one hour. But today it's going to be a faster development. Let's see, so would you use the company staff or user table or a new separate table? So for this, you can use, like if you're, I always tell people, if you're building an internal application, you really just need one user table, one directory. And inside that directory, you will have all of your company employees, uh, whether they be HR employees, sales employees, marketing employees, because we can use a role field in the table or directory to identify uh, which group of people belongs to what department. So if you have somebody in your company who needs to manage these events, let's, let's say uh, maybe your HR team, or maybe you have an event planner, I don't know, at the company. 
you can assign that employee a role, event planner, and when they log in as part of your staff member, uh, they will be able to manage these events on the in the back end. You can create a simple um, admin portal for them to log in and be able to manage those events. Now you could you can grant access to other people to have visibility to the admin portal as well uh, if you want to. But internal applications typically have one user table. You don't need more than one user table. Okay, or one directory in this case. Now, if you're allowing customers or attendees to sign up as well, let's say, for example, you go to event details and you click on the event sign up, but you want them to register first before they can to create the account before they can sign up for the event. You can do that. In that case, you would have a second directory for your uh, customers because you don't want to mix your customers in the same directory as your internal employees. It becomes really difficult to manage and filter out your customers from your internal employees. Uh, let's see. Yes, for the admin event could be for both. Uh, event could be for both to register, right? Yes, public facing event for clients to attend to. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I made it simple. I don't want anyone to sign up or register, or create the account. I just want them to fill out that information, and then we have that information inside the portal. Yeah, I think it's a little bit easier. Okay. So let's get into it. Inside Caspio, I'm going to walk you through all my tables. Again, very simple application. I only have three tables. My user table is actually my directory table where I have my employees that can log in uh, to the admin portal. And then my two main tables that I have are the events table and the attendees table. The events table is going to store all the information pertaining to the event. So we have the event ID, always add your primary key. It's very important. Then we have the event title, which is text 255. I don't think we're ever going to exceed 255 characters for the event title. We have description, text 64,000. We have the event date, very important. We have the location. Now, when it comes to location, you have a couple of different ways to treat that. You could have a full address, city, state, and zip if you want to. I just made a simple field location where we just capture the city and state. Then you have capacity and capacity count. So these are two important fields. Uh, the admin level user, when you post the event, you're going to set the capacity for that event, meaning I only want 10 people to attend that event. That's going to be the cap. Capacity count, you'll see what the trigger is doing. When the attendee signs up in the attendees table, we are updating the events table to put a plus one for capacity count. Okay, so if one attendee signs up, you're going to see one inside this table. If the second attendee signs up, you're adding a plus one, so you're going to see two. And it's going to be two against 10 if, if, the, class, if the event capacity is 10. So as more attendees sign up, sign up, you're always going to get a plus one inside that field to be added automatically. Then we have the event image and we have the event status, which is going to be published or unpublished. And the, the last table that I have is the attendees table. So whatever information you want to capture from the attendees that are signing up, it's up to you. We have the attendee ID. That's the primary key. Then we have the event ID because we need to associate the attendees to the events, right? One to many. And then we're capturing first name, last name, full name, title, phone, and email. Okay, very simple, but you could have uh, additional fields if you want to capture more data. Now on the attendees table, because that's the trigger table, right? So when the attendee signs up, we have the information inside this table, but at the same time, I want to update the events table. So we have two triggers created here. One to add the attendee to the events table, and one is to subtract the attendee from the events table. So if I look at the first one, and just as a reminder, you will have this application available to, uh, to download in the description of the YouTube video. So if you want to see how this was done, you will be able to import this into your account and definitely study from it and learn and reverse engineer anything that you need to. So let's take a look at this trigger. It runs on insert of data, meaning when you insert data into the attendees table, some action needs to happen. So we're basically updating the events table. Okay. And we want to set the uh, capacity count to plus one. Okay, very simple. I need to join my um, the inserted table to the event ID. 
to the events table because we need to know for what event do we need to update, right? So if the attendee signs up for the first event, we need to know that we need to update the row for that event. And then the condition here is where um, capacity is greater than capacity count, which makes sense. If the capacity is set to 10 and we have five attendees who signed up, that's greater than five, that's the condition, go ahead and add plus one. Okay, so that makes sense. And we're also updating the events table where we set the status to false if the capacity equals the capacity count. So now if 10 equals to 10, we want to set the status to false, meaning uncheck the uh, status so it's no longer published on the web. Okay, a super simple trigger. I've done this one before in our Caspio live session previously. Um, so if you want to see a step-by-step -step on how to set this up, just go to our triggered actions video uh, for a previously held live stream. And the second trigger that we have, uh, let me come back here, is to subtract. So very much like the other one with a few modifications. So now what we want is to subtract one, okay, where we have the condition where the capacity is greater than or equal to a capacity count. Okay, so if you remove the attendee, then we simply just subtract one from the capacity count. Very simple, and then set the event status to true if the capacity is greater than capacity count. So no longer equals 10 equals 10, right? Because that's going to change it to false. Now that the capacity is greater than the capacity count, so if it's 10 and 9, then it makes sense to check the box again to make it available for other attendees to be able to sign up. Okay. And that's the second trigger. We also have a task that looks for the expiration on the event. So because we have the event date, right now I have the task running on demand, but normally you would set the frequency here and configure this to run daily or weekly, depending on the application. I have it running on demand. And we're simply updating the events table and changing the status to false if the event date is less than the today's date which makes sense, right? If the event is, let's say, held today or yesterday, and today's date is the, the third, all right, we want to set the status to false. We don't want that to be visible anymore because it has expired. And we don't want anyone else to sign up. And the second um, task that's running here is to send an email notification to the attendee one day prior to the event to let them know as a reminder, hey, your event is tomorrow, and then you can customize that message to whatever you want. So we select from the attendees table because we need to grab the attendees email. Okay, we join the event ID to the event ID because we need to grab the event date. And then you can see here now the condition is where the difference in days equals to one from the event date and today's date, which makes sense, right? So if the event is today, or let's say the event is tomorrow on the fourth. Today is the third, so that equals to one compared to today's date. And what we're doing is simply sending that email as a reminder with the subject line and the message to the attendee. Now you can customize this to be a lot more complex if you want to. You can also send one more email a week before the event. It's completely up to you. It doesn't even have to be days. It can be years. It can be months. It can even be hours, maybe an hour before the event. Um, so it's, yeah, you know, it's a very simple automation tool where we can subtract and add attendees. Uh, to the events table, and we can send out this email and also change the false of the status if the event expires. And finally, I have one authentication created, which is piggybacking on the directory table to allow my uh, user or staff to log in and be able to manage all the events. And what we're going to do next is build out all the data pages. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions on the triggers, on the task, on the table? Uh, let me know before we proceed in building out all the forms and reports. I will just give you a heads up. Uh, most of, at least on the public facing side, a lot of this is utilizing low code um, because in order to lay out the data the way I have here, where we have the button on the right, we have the data on the left, uh, we have the image, and this is also a clickable link as well. It does the same thing as the button. Uh, we are using some low code HTML and CSS to 
organize the layout of our information. Uh, can you send an image with the task email? Good question. I don't know that you can. Uh, let me actually see. I've never done it, so let me see. Uh, let's go to task. Let's see if we can insert that as a parameter. It's a good question. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see the ability to send the image, so we cannot include a file, unfortunately. It's a great question. I've never actually tried to send an image in the, in the automatic email. Yeah, I don't see my image field listed here. I'll take a look at this offline as well. I'm kind of curious now. Uh, if there is a way, I'm trying to think. So this is a plain text. If we were to do an HTML email, let's see. Even with the HTML, I'm not able to do it. Okay. Because now when you flip this to HTML, here you can add your, uh, your own custom HTML code if you want. And it's going to render that when the user receives it. Uh, but there's just no way to include the file data type inside the body of the email. Okay. It is nice to add a logo, you're right. Um, I know that with the, uh, well, if you're just gonna add a logo, you could. If you, uh, let's say, if you're not pulling the image from the table, but you just want to include a logo, then yes, you can flip this to an HTML, and then just at the very top, you can just do an image source tag equals, and then URL to your logo, uh, and then just set the width maybe style equals width to maybe, I don't know, uh, 200 pixels like that. And this will put the logo, because uh, it's going to render that HTML when a user receives the email, and it'll be at the very top of the email. But if you're pulling the image from the database, as you can see, we don't have a way to include that um, file as a parameter here, because it's not listed from the table. Okay. But Logo, yes, you can include the logo. As long as you have the logo hosted somewhere and you have the reference, the URL reference that a logo, and you can include that in between the quotes. Okay. We're not doing that today, so let's remove it, and let's just flip that back to plain text. If you have plain text, then you're not going to have that image source tag in here. It's not going to render it. You're just going to see that image bracket in the email as, as written as is. Okay. Good question. Good question. We both learned something new today. <laughs> All right, let's go back to data pages. And let's uh, begin with the folders. You know, we want to have a public facing folder for all of, our, all of our public facing data pages. And we want to have an internal folder for all of our internal facing data pages. So we have public and we have internal, right? So now what, how do we want to begin? Well, let's begin by creating this listing. Okay, so that'll be the first thing that we create. So we're gonna go inside our public folder and set up our very first data page. Reports, and as I mentioned, we wanna do gallery. I think that looks nice for the events, especially if, you're, if your results page has images. If you're building, let's say, a real estate application, I would opt out to have a gallery layout. Okay, or list. Tabular, not so much, because tabular is really reserved for uh, textual data. So if you have like a short answer, it's nice to see things in rows and columns. Let's go with gallery, hit next. And my data source table obviously needs to be the events table. That's where my image is. That's where all the event information resides. Let's call this event listing. And then for my style, I believe I have a custom style created for today. Let's go with this one here for public facing data pages. And for localization, we're going to go with English. And this is going to be a public facing data page. So there's no need to pass or protect it. Let's hit next. Uh, we're going to filter. I don't have a search form enabled. As you can see, I'm just showing the listings. I don't anticipate having too many listings where I'm going to need to have a search form for people to find those listings. Usually events, you might have, I don't know, five to 10 events per year, which is going to be very easy to find if you just simply scroll up and down. But if there is a case where you have 1,000 events for your website, then it makes sense to have a search form so you can filter them out and look for the one that you need to. So we're going to do a predefined. We're going to hit Next. And on the results page, 
sorry, this is a filtering one. So for the filtering, we want to have um, the event status because we want to only display the published ones. So this needs to be the filtering field and we want that to be checked. So as long as the event is published or checked, it's going to be visible on the front end. Let's hit next. Now, if you're using standard features in Caspi without any coding, you could accomplish that. It just won't look as nice. Okay. Uh, so what I mean by that is, let's say you want to have the image at the very top. You could. Uh, you want to display the title of the event. You could. Description is going to be for our details page. Let's say you want to have the location of the event and event date, which is exactly the information I have displayed right over here. But if you're using standard features in Caspio, you're going to hit next. Obviously, we don't want anyone to be able to delete or modify our uh, public facing events. So we're going to leave those unchecked. We're going to hit next. And now you can just customize the event image. So you can set this image to maybe be, I don't know, 450 pixels in width. Um, you have your title, you have your location, you have your event date. And then you're going to add that HTML block where you create the link to go to the event details. So in my example, I have a button and I also have the title doing the same exact thing. So when I click on the event details, it takes me to a new page of my website where I have the details uh, of that event. But in the process, I'm passing the event ID. So then you're going to just simply say um, event details. You're going to highlight that text, click on the link button. And then you're going to take the user to event details.html. And in the process, you're going to pass the event ID as a parameter inside the URL. And you're done. So this is standard features. It still looks presentable. It's just not as nice as having the information laid out, which you're about to see how we use HTML and CSS to accomplish that. Okay. But I would like to have an icon. I would like my button to be next to my information. And this is. I mean, to me, it looks presentable and nicely organized. I'm just going to complete this so that you can see what it looks like with standard features. OK, so I'm going to hit next, next, and I'm going to disable that and hit preview. And here's what it looks like using standard features. Now, I could remove the label if I wanted to. So if I come back to my account, go back, 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 event image. If I take out the label, let's just say, and hit preview again, now you see the image at the very top, but the information is going to be laid out this way where this is now a clickable link. Of course, you can change the color of that clickable link to something else. So it appears blue. Now, if you ask me comparing standard features versus a little bit of customization, obviously we can tell which one looks a little bit nicer. So in that case, what I usually end up doing is including an HTML block. And inside this HTML block, you can insert fields as parameters and you can organize this the way you want using some HTML and CSS. I'm going to disable the toolbar. And now if you do have some basic knowledge of HTML and CSS, I'm just going to go ahead and paste that in here. We're not going to code that from scratch because it will take a while. So I'm just going to copy what I have here in a different screen and paste all of that here. And I'll just explain what I did. Okay, let me just create some separation here so that uh, it's a little bit nicer to visualize. So let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that and that. OK. So the very first uh, three rows that you see is simply for the image. I always like to add, even though the margin is zero, I always like to add that in advance. So later on, if I do need to position my image slightly to the left, slightly to the right, up and down, later on, I can come back and um, add my, uh, my value because it's just a title. Actually, this can be removed. I don't know why I did that. So. In the second div, we have the title, which is underneath the image. Um, and then we have with equals 100%. And then it takes me to event details where I pass the event ID. And then I include the, um, the title field as a parameter. So you can see here on the front end, it is a clickable link. And it's simply a title that takes me to the event details. Underneath that, we have our third div, which now places the information using float left. We have some margins to put uh, spacing at the top and the bottom. I include my icons for map, my icon for calendar. And then we have our two fields for location and event added as parameters once again. OK, and the last div is simply that button. It's simply a URL, same as this one up here. We have the same exact thing. You can see event details passing the event ID. 
And for that hyperlink, I'm able to add my property and value in inline CSS to make it look like a button as opposed to just a simple URL link. So we have a border, which is blue. We have the color of the text, which is blue. And then we have some uh, background color, which is white and some padding around the text uh, to create that effect to make it look like a button. Okay. And then once you have all of your information inside the HTML block, you can just remove because that'll just duplicate everything. So you take this out, take this out, take the event date out, and this can be removed as well. Because now all of the information is inside the HTML block. If I hit preview, okay, you can see what it looks like. We have our title, we have our um, information on the left, and we have our button. The reason why you don't see an icon just yet is because I'm using the preview and Caspio is not recognizing the icons until I embed this into my web page because my web page has the library for all the icons. Okay, my website. And that's it for this one, except that we want to have three columns as opposed to two. Let me see anything else, no details, and click finish. And we're gonna take that, deploy that, grab our embed code, copy it, and then using my Notepad++, let me bring that into the view. We have the events listing. We're going to paste that deploy code here, save it, and let's publish it. So I'll go refresh, move the events page to the right. So it's now live. And let's go to that correct URL. So someapp.com MP, um, MP Corp Live index.html. And we're going to go to the events page. And now you're going to be able to see all of those events listed on my front end, on my website. The next thing that we need to do is create the event details. So you can see there's no details yet, but we need to create that in Caspio and embed it. So we'll create a brand new data page. And what we need is we need a direct the details. Let's hit next. So again, based on the events table, because that's where the information is being pulled from. So we're going to call this event details. Style is going to be the same style as before, same localization. Hit next, filter data. And can somebody tell me what our filtering field needs to be? Just a little quiz for all of you Caspio veterans. If you're still uh, <laughs> paying attention and you haven't uh, started looking at something else on a different screen, what do you think is my filtering field in order to pull up the events information? It is the ID. Yeah, correct, the event ID, very good. So that's, our, that's my filtering field because we need to receive that event ID from the results page, okay? So we're gonna hit next. And then in the advanced tab, we're gonna receive it externally and that needs to be EID, which stands for event ID, because that's the parameter that we use when we pass the event from the results page. Now we need to receive that ID, so the naming convention has to be the same and value must be required. Now in the details page, you have to include at least one field. Okay, there's no way to uh, hit next otherwise. So I have to include for now, I have to include one field. So we're gonna include that field, let's say title, hit next. And just like the results page, what we looked at earlier, if you want to use just standard features, you could include your fields into the details view. So you don't have to worry about the code. But the code allows us to, again, make things look a little bit nicer. So you can see how I have the image that are left and then we have all the information on the right side. So we're going to hit next. And once again, I'm going to add my HTML block. We're going to disable the toolbar. And I'm just going to copy. Uh, well, there's a couple of things that we're going to need to add to this details page. Uh, but first, we're going to grab my code for the uh, layout of the information. Let me just find it. Um, OK, so here we have it. We're going to copy all of that. Row, copy, and paste. Okay, it looks intimidating. I promise you it's not. I have done so many sessions now with our live streams, even a how-to tutorial on how to add all of these properties and values. Uh, I promise you, like I said before, it's really not that complicated. Unfortunately, it messes up my formatting, so I kind of need to see. Uh, okay. So the first div you can see is the main div that includes all the information in between. And you can see I've added a box shadow, and this is just a random 
um, code that I found online to create the box shadow around my box. You can see the shadow around the box. That's the first div. Uh, there's some padding which has 20 pixels, border radius of 5 pixels. So you can see we have padding of 20 pixels, border radius of 5 pixel. Um, then in the second div, let's see what we have. We have the image, so that's in the second div. Uh, and then in the div after that, we have the information that has the title and description. So that appears on the right side, title and description. And then we also have uh, our two icons for location and the event. And then we have that href button, which now uses the modal to open up that modal window. So from the details page, we can click on the event sign up to bring this form up inside the modal, which again, we have covered in the past uh, many, many times. But because that modal is going to launch from this details page, we need to include additional code. So we're going to add a header and footer, take out the toolbar, which is something I always do. And then we're going to copy a little snippet of code that I have here on the left in my Word document. Just bear with me for a second while I grab all that information. All right, style, copy and paste. We talked about this before. I know it looks like a lot of code. Believe me or not, believe me when I say this, every, all the style elements that you see here, properties and values belong to that modal. You can see modal, 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 modal. Everything is modal for the content in terms of how um, that box that shows up uh, is going to be, is going to look in terms of styling and the aesthetics. Okay. And I'll just go down so you can make, you can see. So because all of those elements have their own style, like the modal title, the body of the modal footer. Okay. And then at the, at the very end, we have two script libraries that are going to make that modal function. You know, that's what allows it to, to pop up. In the footer section, we also need to add some information as well. So let's disable the HTML editor and let's find that code as well that we'll need. So let me just copy and paste that. All right, so let me copy that. And again, for those of you who have attended my live streams in the past, we've done all of this before, so it shouldn't be anything new. For those of you, if you're attending the live stream for the very first time, um, Caspio, first and foremost, is a no-code platform. Everything that I do here can be done using no-code. Okay, but as I always like to repeat myself, we like to push the, uh, the boundaries with some low code to make things look nicer and functional for the front end, okay, for your end user. I'll just give you an example of what I'm talking about. Like for example, this event signup, I don't have to use a modal, but you can see how everything appears on one screen. It's easier for the end user. What I could have done is if I click on that link or that button, it takes me to a new web page where I embed my signup form. That is using standard features. So if I click on that button, it's going to take me to a new page of my website where I have that form embedded. Okay, but you can see how seamless this is just by having it appear without me having to navigate to a completely different page. That's why we like to create some more dynamic workflows using low code. But at least you know that you can, you know, with Caspio. And it all uses industry standard languages. There's nothing proprietary here. This is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay, so we're going to leave this the way it is for now uh, because I need to build my form, my sign-up form, which we're going to do next. And then in my HTML block, we're going to find that button, uh, which is right over here because you can see my button. I need to call out the app key to the sign-up form. And in the footer section, we're also going to replace two bits of information here, which is the account ID and also the prefix. So we're going to leave this the way it is. The one thing that I will need to do is I need to hide the title field. In the details page, there is no way to, uh, to, to remove that. You have to at least include one bound field. So we're going to add one HTML block above the field. And then let me just grab my code to hide that information. So just give me a second. All right. So we're going to hide that field by adding one line of code, which is our table. You can see table style display none, TRTD. And then underneath the field, we're going to add one more HTML block and simply just hide that information so it's not visible. The reason why I want to hide the title field is because I already have the title field included here. You can see it right over here as a parameter. There's no need to create any kind of redundancy to include additional titles in that description. 
And I think that's all that we need to add. Uh, we have our information along with the button. We are hiding the field. The footer is going to launch the modal. And in the header, we have the styling for the modal and our two libraries. And now we can hit finish. But again, we'll have to come back to this data page in just a moment. Let's deploy that. Grab the embed code. If you would like to see a complete how-to tutorial on the modal, uh, which goes into really into detail, look for um, our previous live stream that we did a couple of weeks ago. Just search for on YouTube, search for Caspio modal, and that's going to give you the, the session on how I go through the detailed uh, work on adding that to your application. Okay, so event details, we're going to just replace our text. Let's push that page live. Let's reload this event details. And now if everything goes well, let's close that. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Let's go back to our events page and let's go into the details for this one here. And there's my details page, right? It's like magic, you know? <laughs> um, let me know if you guys prefer to have me um, in the future live streams. If you want me to code it out, I can. I can sit there and type it out myself. It just takes a lot of back and forth um, in order to get the uh, the exact layout that I want to have. So it's going to be a lot of tweaking. We might have to break out the live stream into multiple sessions then, part one, part two, part three, or something like that, because, yeah, coding takes a little while, you know, because it's a lot of fine-tuning to get the uh, precise uh, layout. Uh, let me see. If I use Bootstrap on my HTML page, will this mess up your code? Uh, if you're using Bootstrap, in some cases, it does mess up the code. Yes, that's why I pulled out the modal um, from the library that I usually use in my header of my data page. So I pulled all of the uh, um, the classes for the modal, and now I just include the modal in my header because I know that way it's not going to mess up at least the modal that pops up. Uh, but if you're using Bootstrap for all the other HTML and CSS, I don't think it normally, you can see it didn't mess up anything for me. And I didn't even have to use the important rule. Um, so, you know, usually if you want to supersede or overwrite your bootstrap CSS, a lot of times you might have to add something like this. Um, important. In order to um, have your style override the bootstrap style. So we just use that declaration important rule in order to do that. But as you can see, I didn't have to do any of that. Oh, well, actually, I did right over here. You can see and here. Maybe in a couple of places I did. Let me see. Um, font size, 17 pixels, important. Right. So my bootstrap for the P um, for paragraph, it already has its own style, right? Maybe it's set to 15 pixels. But in my data page, I set it to 17 pixels, and I add the important rule so that I can override whatever my bootstrap has. So that's how I would treat that. Uh, it would be nice to see my code in Notepad++. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I can bring that up. So here is the code for my HTML markup, right? So this is my code for the HTML. Um, I also have my CSS for all of that, too. So uh, let's see. So if I go into my assets in my CSS, I can open this up in my Notepad++, right? So if I'm looking for, let me see if I can find it. I might take me a while to find it uh, for the paragraph. Don't know exactly where it is. But if you look for it, you will see that maybe it has like 15 pixels or something like that. And I override that using 17 pixels with the important rule. So it supersedes the CSS from my template. So you kind of go back and forth a little bit, you know, in order to uh, get the exact precise layout and style. Judith, let me know if that answers the question. I just want to make sure that you know that even if you add your own custom HTML CSS in the data page, if you do embed it into Bootstrap, you might have to tweak some things by adding important or you can, if you like the styling of the paragraph uh, class that you have from the Bootstrap, then you can take this out and it'll just inherit whatever the CSS you have from the Bootstrap template. Okay. Good. Good. Glad to hear it. All right, so next thing that we're going to work on uh, is the event sign up form. Okay, so we're going to build a brand new data page here. And this one, thankfully, will be a little bit simpler. We don't need to uh, um, include any code. 
is we're building a simple submission form uh, based on the attendees table. And let's call this sign up form. For my style, I'm going to use the same style. Localization will be English. Hit next. I need all my fields in the form. We're going to hit next. And the form also needs to receive the event ID. There's one thing that I forgot to do in the previous data page that we developed. So we need to receive the event ID because we have to know what attendee is signing up for what event, right? We need to so make that association between our two tables. So in the advanced tab, we're going to receive externally as EID. Okay. And in the standard tab, we're going to simply just hide that field. That field does not need to be visible on the submission form. You don't need to expose that information to your application user. Okay. Just know that every time you open up that form in the background, even though it's a hidden field, it's always going to receive the event ID. First name can be required, last name required, title required, phone number may be optional or required, and email. We have formatting for the email that we can follow as well. And what I like to do is when they sign up, I just want to take the user back to the um, events page, or you can have some kind of a confirmation page, but just to make things a little bit simpler for me, I'm just going to redirect the user back to this page. Once they fill out that form and hit submit. Okay. We don't need to embed the form into our website. We're going to just deploy that form, enable it, and then hit the properties link to grab our app key. So we're going to grab the last, I don't know how many digits. So everything after the eighth digit, basically we grab, we copy, and then in the event details, we now need to find our button uh, and replace the previously used app key with that one. And I'm actually, uh, I am passing the event ID. You can see in my modal code, um, by adding a question mark to initiate the string, we have the EID equals and then the event ID that we passed to the sign up form. So that's also very important in order to receive the event ID. Okay, let's hit finish. Grab one more bit of information from the signup form, which is the first eight digits. So we need this number as well. Go back to event details. And inside the footer section, we are simply going to replace this number with that number. Um, and I think that this is my same, it's the same account that I use. So I don't need to worry about the account ID. But if you want to find the account ID, you can go to your account settings. And you can find that account ID by copying that information right there. And I think it should work now. So let's go ahead and test this out. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, we have our HTML block to hide the field. We have our text. We have that. I think we're good to go. Let's hit finish and try it out. So event details. Click on the sign up form and there's my form. Now I just need to make some modifications to my form. I can add my labels as placeholders inside the field or I can put them on top of my fields. This is mostly about the layout. Okay, so I wouldn't really worry about this for now. We're not going to spend the time to, to do any of that. But let's just fill out this form. Let's just test it out. We'll say Ned, our last name, PE, phone number, something arbitrary, and then email can be mp at caspio.com. And we'll hit submit. It should take me to the events page, the events listings, and it does. And then in my database table, we should be able to see myself listed as the attendee. Okay, there I am. And I just, okay, so I signed up for this event here, uh, accelerate app development with no code. Okay, let's remember that accelerate app development with no code, because when I go back to my events table, accelerate app development with no code, accelerate app development with no code, low code. Well, my trigger should have actually uh, set this to one, but it didn't which is interesting. Let me make sure my triggers are actually working and enabled. Oh, they're disabled. Okay. That's my fault. So let's enable both of these triggers so they're active. Okay. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to make one more submission, make sure that the trigger is working the way it's supposed to. So we'll just say Sarah Lee title, CEO, phone number, something random and Sarah at test.com and hit submit. All right, so let's just take a look. Yep, there's the counter. Okay, so now the trigger is firing off. We have one um, registered attendee, and you can see the class capacity um, against uh, the class uh, capacity count. 
Now, if I log in as the admin, which we now need to create, so let's uh, let's go to that page as well. Sumapp.com uh, np um, np um, admin live manage events dot html so now we need to build all of our data pages for the admin user to log in and be able to gain access to all that functionality so back inside caspio let's begin by creating the event sign up form not the event sign i'm sorry the um, the ability for the admin user to create the event so we need a submission form so we'll hit create data page i need a submission form we're going to hit next and we need the events table to be our source table, and we're going to create. Uh, we're going to call this create event. So I have a separate style for my admin data pages, okay? Because they don't need to look as nice <laughs> as an admin. Don't really care too much about the aesthetics. It still looks presentable, but it's not as nice as on the front end. And we have English, and then restrict access to my authentication that I set up. Okay, we have next. Uh, let's just move all the fields on the submission form for now. Hit next. The title is most likely going to be a required field. Description is going to be a required field. I'm going to change that to a text area so we have a nice box that we can see what we're typing. Event date is definitely a required field. Location is a required field. Uh, capacity is a required field. So we need to set the capacity, how many attendees can sign up. And for capacity count, I'm going to actually turn this into a hidden field and change the uh, default value to zero. Because in the table of events, we need to have a numerical value in there in order for the trigger to work correctly. Now, there is a way to use the case statement in the, uh, in the trigger as well to accomplish that. But this is a simpler solution. You don't have to add too much to the trigger. So if you just set the zero initially, because that's where it's going to be, uh, then it adds that zero and the trigger will work every other time. Because now it recognizes the zero in the table and it can add a plus one each time to the uh, capacity count. Event image, uh, let's say that's a required field as well. Um, and then for event status, well, you can say check to publish event. And we can just call this, yeah, event status is fine. And then we'll have your submission was successful. All right, so let's deploy that data page. Grab our embed code, copy it. And then let's go back to new event. Paste, save, and let's publish. So what I'm going to do is switch over to a different folder that I have. So my admin facing data pages are in a completely different folder. So admin live. Let's go back to the root folder and find admin live. OK, so we have the new event page. We're going to move that to the right. Let's go back to my website, go to new event, and we should be able to see that form here in just a moment. But it's probably going to ask me to log in, of course. So what I need to do is go back to my previous one log out because I'm using the same directory, unfortunately, um, to my to to showcase my live example, my demo and also our build today. So I'm using the same directory. So that's why I have to um, to do that. So we're going to log in as John Doe, who is inside my directory. Here is my user and we're going to log in. OK. That makes a lot of sense. Why did that happen? John Doe at company.com from the same exact directory. I logged out from my live example. I thought I thought I already logged out. What's going on? Why is it redirecting me back to the Let me log out one more time and try to sign in. Okay, so that's fine. Let me close that. Close that. Yeah, give me a second. Let me come back to my URL. Normally, I would bookmark this to my browser, but um, manage events.html. I really hope that I know it's going to take me back to the login screen, but for some reason, if I log in as John, why is it not redirecting me back to my? my live bill today. So let's just John Doe at company.com. Sorry, I'm just trying to think to see if that happens again. Why would it not just take me to the new URL that I've put together for today's live bill? Continue.
Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Let's go back to my table of users. Using this table, there's John Doe. I'm using the same directory, so why is it not? Let me edit this. Okay. Okay, let's go to our directory to find John Doe. Inside my directory. I apologize. Um, you know, there's no perfect demo out there. Usually all demos have some some errors in some way. We always strive for perfection, but it's never happened. <laughs> okay, so it's okay. All right, good. So I have John Doe inside the directory, but I'm just wondering why it's saying that it's not recognizing me as the user when I'm in here. Uh, so let's come over here. Admin, yeah, that's right, John Company dot com. I mean, I know how to fix it, but I just I want to use the same directory. I don't want to have to make a copy of my directory and then use that directory as my. I thought that I could use the same directory. It's just taking me to a completely different page, which doesn't make any sense. Sumapp dot com np apps np um, admin, not apps, sorry, uh, mp admin live new event dot html. Ah, that's really frustrating. <laughs> ah, okay. Am I not allowed to make how use the same directory in two different applications? Then I should be able to do that. What if we use cross application login? Does that exist? Let's see. Let's go to authentications here. Expand this. What if we say only one session per user? I wonder if that will at least do a quick fix for me. Because then if I log out from that session, I can log into a different session. I'm not able to be but I logged out from the other session, which is why it's so confusing to me right now. Okay, let me let me just try that, and hopefully that at least gives us a temporary fix until I figure out later what uh, is going on here. So if I do that, yeah, you see, it's like it's logging me back into my live example, the one that I built for today, using the same directory, but in my copied application, I use the same directory, and for some reason, it's it log it logs me to this application and the other application. So let me. And this is the first time I'm encountering this, so just bear with me for a second, because directory is, is a somewhat of a new feature in Caspio. Let me try logging out. Okay, so I logged out from this session. Let's come back here into my actual live example. And let's go first to sumapp.com, np apps, not apps, np admin, live manage events. So we'll go here first, because I know I don't have a data page here deployed, but if I come here, it's going to ask me to log in. Let me try that one more time, John Doe at company.com. Ah, that's so annoying. <sighs> I might just have to. I might just have to create my authentication based on not the directory in this case, but just build something very quickly, at least for today's live session until I figure out why this is happening. So, yeah, so sorry about that. Let me go ahead and see if I can make a copy of this table and data. Oh, and this is still a directory though. And if I make a copy of uh, the original directory, it's I still have to use the original directory. I can't use this one because this table doesn't have a directory associated with it. Because our tables are basically directories, our user tables. So what we'll do, um, just as a quick fix for now, I'm just going to create something for an admin to be able to log in. So I apologize for that. Um, I don't know how else to go, get around that for now. I'll have to figure it out later on. So we'll just have name, email and password. I have to figure this out. 
eventually. So, okay, save this table as um, NP, uh, what is it, event management uh, user table. I'll add myself as the user. So I'll use a regular table as opposed to a directory, okay? Just as a quick fix for now. Ned np at test.com and we'll just put password to be test. Okay, and I just have to build my authentication. Let me see if I can edit my existing one. And we'll use custom, but for my data source, we'll use the table I just created and we're gonna use the email and password fields. Let me see if I need to do anything in the advanced tab. Uh, I don't think that I need to. We'll save. Um, so there's my authentication. So let's go back to the data page. And let's just see what that looks like. So we will go back to the internal, hit edit. It should still be using, using the same authentication. Let's just verify. Yeah, it's still using the same authentication. Click finish. Let's see what it looks like on the front end. So we'll go back once again, sumapp.com, NP, um, NP, admin, live, manage events. And then let's go to new event and it should have a login screen. Okay. Well, I'll figure out in terms of directory later on, but at least now I know that I can log in as, <laughs> I forgot my credentials. Let me go back to my table. I know the password is test, np at test.com. np at test.com, test. Okay, so there's my form. Five years later, we get to it finally. Let me see if there are any comments here. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I agree too. I just don't want to spend too much time troubleshooting, but I will find a solution to this and let you guys know in the next live session what ended up happening here because it's strange. I should be able to use the same directory, even though I have the same employees in that same directory, I should be able to use that across multiple applications. And that's essentially what I have. I have my demo that I demoed at the very beginning of live stream. That's already a completed solution using that directory. And then I made a copy of my application, again, using the same directory. So if I log out of the other application, I should be able to log into this one without any errors that took place, just what we were able to witness just now. Uh, to be continued, yeah. So there's my add new event form. Now we're gonna build is the manage events. So let's go back to Caspio. Now that we've eaten up a lot of our time trying to figure out the directory thing. So let's build a new data page here to manage events. Report, tabular format, hit next, based on the events table. Let's call this manage events. Style, I have the same style created. Localization English, restrict access to our authentication and hit next. We want the results underneath, display the results on the initial load. No need for RLS, because you're the admin level user, you should see all the events. And then let's start, just search for based on title. I apologize, we're running out of time here, but just to speed things up, let's just have the title field for now, but keep in mind that you could have additional search fields uh, if you'd like. Um, let me just think if there's anything else I wanna filter on, maybe event status, just to have an additional field here. So title will use contains, and this is going to be a yes and no. I always like to say published for display, unpublished, or no, and then I would like to default to any. So it shows me everything, whether it's published or unpublished. On the results page, let's have the image. I remember having an image on the results page. Let's have the title. Uh, let's have the event date, location, capacity, capacity count, and the event status can also be there as well. We're gonna hit next. Um, do I have the ability to edit directly from here? I could, I don't think that I did that in the live example. Actually, let's log into our live example. Okay, so let's see, we have the event status published, no editing capability, but I know this is an HTML block to take me to the details page. So we're gonna go back here to the, we're gonna hit next and then add the HTML block. And very simple here, we're gonna make the title be the clickable link. So we're gonna add our href link equals, uh, we call that page, Edit details. So that page is called edit details.html. Once again, we're going to pass the EID for the event ID. 
to the details page and we're gonna call this well let me make sure I remember my quotes and then we're gonna insert the title to be the clickable link and we're gonna close that href link so if I include my title here in the HTML block, I don't need my title field in the results page. I'll just duplicate the info. And I would like to have my image be the very first thing on my results page. And let's have that be displayed maybe a 75 pixels. So it's a little bit, a little bit smaller. Okay, we'll hit next. Let's display 25 uh, events per page. And why don't we display them based on the event, uh, the, most, the, the, most, the one that's upcoming first, and then we're gonna have all the ones after that. No details page because we're going to create a separate details page here. We're almost done. I only need to have two more data pages created here. So let's deploy this to our website, copy it. And here we're going to have manage events. Paste. Save and publish. Manage events. Okay, so manage events. Um, Login. Okay, so it looks almost the same as what we have in the other live example, uh, except I should have custom formatted my yes and no to published and unpublished. I didn't do that, but at the very least, we can see the capacity and capacity count. And then when I click on this link, it's gonna take me to the event details or edit details and the attendees report. So let's build those very quickly here. So we're gonna build a quick data page to edit the details. So for this one, we can do direct to details. Uh, based on the events table, we're going to call this edit details. Style is going to be my admin style that I created. Localization English, restrict access, hit next. Yeah, that's right. Um, let's filter the data based on the EID. So that needs to be my receiving field. External parameter EID. Same as before, value required. And then in the details page, we want to be able to edit this information, right? So let's include the, those fields. Title is going to be an editable field, editable field, make it required. Description, same thing, make that field required. Event date is going to be editable. Make that required. Location, same thing. Capacity, same thing. We don't need the capacity count. We're not editing that information. Uh, but capacity, you should be able to edit, right? Because if I want to up the number from the attendees to something else or remove it, I should be able to do that. Event image, uh, let's move this at the bottom. Event status is going to be a checkbox. Check to publish event. And then the event image is going to be, let's just have it displayed as a file. Okay, and then you can replace the image with something else. And uh, yeah, we don't need to navigate to the Next record from the details page, we're gonna hit finish and let's deploy this one. And actually I have two more data pages after this one to create. So edit details. So this is edit details. Okay, we can now publish that page. Ah, ah what did I just do? I went to a different folder. Let's stop. Admin live. Edit details, let's move that live and let's have a look. I should be able to now see the information for that event at the very top. And now I wanna be able to display all the attendees uh, that have signed up for this event uh, directly underneath. It's a nice thing to be able to see immediately from the details page, all the linked attendees. So we're gonna build one more data page here. Uh, let's go to tabular format based on the attendees table. View attendees. Same style. A lot of this is just repetitive. Hit next. Uh, let me think, yeah, so we want to filter based on the event ID, right? That's how we're able to see all the attendees for that event. And we're almost done. Uh, value required, hit next. And then what information you want to display for your attendees. So maybe first name, last name, title, phone, and email. And I do want the ability to do an inline delete because if I want to remove that attendee from the event, I can. Okay, so I think in my live example, I have something like that where we go to um, the event details. Let's say this one here. And then I can remove that attendee from the details page 
which will the trigger will then fire and subtract one from the events table for the capacity count. Okay, so we have that, we have that. Uh, don't really need to do anything else here, and we can disable the details page and click that. Okay, let's deploy that. Grab our embed code. And we have a placeholder text for that. And we have one more data page left. So let's move edit details to the right. Let's refresh, and I think this is going to say no records found, or we have two people that have signed up for this event. And that's the information I submitted earlier. Okay, so it's working correctly. All right. And the final data page that's left to create is to manage attendees. Okay. Now you could also argue and say, well, I can manage my attendees by going directly to here. And if I click on the details, uh, I will be able to manage my attendees. By the way, if you see a discrepancy here, because you can see uh, capacity count is nine out of 10, but when I go to the details, you can see only five. There's a reason behind that. It's because I, before I built my trigger, I was doing some testing. Um, and that's why I only had five disable the trigger. So that's why you see um, a difference there, but it's working the way it's supposed to. Normally when you sign up, it'll just be one, it'll say one. Once the trigger is set up and you remove the sample data that you were testing with. Okay, manage attendees is the very last data page. So create data page, uh, reports, let's go with the tabular format, hit next, based on the attendees table. And we can just say manage attendees. I do wanna see uh, what I created in my live example. I have some grouping going on. So we have the search capability and we're grouping based on the title and we can see the attendee information, okay. So restrict access. Uh, let's make sure we have the right style and the right localization. So we have search below, we have the display results, no need for RLS, and we search for now, let's just have first and last name. And we're gonna use contains just to keep things simple for the interest of time. We're gonna hit next. And then on the results page, I definitely want the event ID so that I can group based on the event title. And then we have first name, last name, title, phone, and email. We're going to hit next. I do have inline delete enabled and I have inline edit enabled. And then let's enable grouping, collapsible group expanded by default. And then we can just call this um, title instead of event ID. And I think we're good. Let's hit next, next, no details, click finish. And this will be the very last one. Of course you can it's up to you how you want to modify these data pages. I'm just going off of what I think makes sense. So let's paste that here and let's go ahead and publish that data page. So we'll refresh and move our manage attendees to the right. Go to manage attendees. And now you can see we're grouping all of our data. So we have uh, the title and we have all the attendee information um, available here as well. Actually, accelerate app development with no code. Accelerate app development with no code. I want to make sure this is working correctly. Accelerate app development with no code. Yeah, the first one, when I added the first user, you, if you remember, I didn't have the trigger enabled. That's why you only see one here. Even though I have two attendees signed up because I didn't enable that um, trigger. Because I want to test this out. If I remove now, let's say we remove Sarah from Accelerate App Development. So let's say we delete her from the front end. If I go back to now uh, Manage Events, that should say zero now, and it does, okay? Because it's subtracting. On the flip side, if I were to now sign up again for that event, Accelerate App Development, you will see one added here until that class capacity is met. I wouldn't mind just showing you how this event uh, also has that other trigger where it's published or unpublished if the uh, capacity count meets the capacity. So 10 out of 10. So automate more with workflows, automate more with workflows. So if I go back to the front end and we do automate more with workflows, is it that one? Automate more workflows with triggered actions. Yeah, that's the one. So if I do sign up, that should give me 10. So we'll just you know sign up as something like this and we'll hit submit. 
Ah, uh, must be an email address. A at a dot com. Hit submit. Revisible. Okay, so it's working correctly. And the automation to um, show and hide these events based on the trigger if the class uh, event capacity is met. All right, so we did eventually end up going over one hour, so I apologize for that because I was trying to figure out the whole directory thing, uh, which I still now need to do some homework after today's live stream to see why that took place. Um, I'll do some testing to see what happened there. Still confused by that, to be honest. Sorry, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> um, you guys are free to go. Thank you so much for attending today's live stream. The, uh, the whole application that we um, developed today will be available for you to download later on today in the description. So just come back to the video if you want this app and if you want to import this into your account to see how everything was created. Uh, come back, I would say around 2 p.m. California time is when I might have this available. But the video is there as well if you want to... Um, see how I went through it. Um, quick question, can I just, can I use just one data page for both the uh, results and details page using a cust using customized codes? Uh, you could, so for example, if you go over here to manage events, right? The only reason, let me just wait for this to load. So the only reason why I broke this out into the details, separate details page. So when I click on the link, you can see I have a separate details page as a second data page is because I am including this data page underneath that because this data page also needs to receive the event ID. However, if you're not doing that, let's say you don't really want to display the attendees in this data page, then yes, you can just have a one data page here that just goes into the details view. Okay, because you don't need to pass the parameter then. It's all tied to the events table. But if you're passing the parameter to the details view, and the only reason why I would do that is in this case, I have a linked data page that also needs to receive the event ID. I hope that makes sense, uh, Lucas. Let me know. A lot, of, a lot of times, it really just depends what you have in the details page. Okay, on that web page. Because if you have multiple data pages on that details view, then yes, you will have to separate the results from the details by passing the parameter in the URL. But if you're only displaying the details page like this without any additional data pages, then you don't have to separate it into two separate data pages. And then you can include your custom code if you'd like. Uh, yeah, no worries. Thank you, uh, Keep Pickens. I appreciate the feedback. Hopefully, we'll see you next Wednesday. By the way, the topic for next Wednesday is all about localizations and how we can use localizations um, to enhance our apps. Because there are some really clever tricks that we can um, add to our localization um, workflow-wise to make things flow more fluidly between data pages. Okay, good, good. Yeah, that's the one that has the... Um, I think I'm, I was using the class capacity to add and subtract students. So it's really just piggybacking on that, on that live stream that we did for triggered actions. It's the same exact trigger, actually. <laughs> but you can see it in a different industry, different application, how it can be uh, tied to it. All right, and just like that, in one hour, we were able to build this, you know, nice application that many organizations can use, you know, if you have events. I was planning on, in the future, what I plan on doing is if there's a public facing application that an organization can use, for example, we have careers, right? So if I click on the careers link, I want to display all the available jobs that people can uh, apply for. And in the back end, in the office here, we have a different drop down that says maybe applicants or managed jobs or or jobs or something like that. So when you expand that, you're going to be able to see manage jobs, manage applicants, uh, create new job. So then on the front end, you can add something else to your website, careers. By the way, if you go to Caspio's careers page, guess what we're using? We have a Caspio data page. This is all Caspio 
Caspio driven. So you go to details. This is all Caspio data page. And then you go to apply now. And here's the Caspio form. So we use our own tool to build these um, front facing applications. Okay, if you go to our app marketplace, <laughs> Also using Caspio to display in a gallery view. Okay, that's all Caspio. Uh, anything else that I can think of? Basically, almost every single form that you see on our website is using a Caspio data page. Let's see, find a partner. Caspio data page. Yeah, I actually took part in developing some of these uh, interfaces. Although it needs to be updated, um, we are in the midst of refreshing our website. Uh, become a partner. Let's see. I think there's a form here. Yep, Caspio data page. So if you are interacting with our website and you fill out some of these forms, um, just know that these are all Caspio data pages being stored in the Caspio table. Okay. I won't keep you any longer. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's live stream and for coming back. I always appreciate your attendance. I know sometimes you can't make it, but the video is always going to be available uh, for you to watch at a later time at your own pace. So I hope that uh, today's session was useful as well. Uh, even though I copied and pasted a lot of code, uh, I didn't really write it all out from scratch because that would take a long time. Um, but the code is available and you can manipulate the code um, as much as you want to for your own fields that you're passing as parameters inside those HTML blocks. Stability. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Judith, thank you, Lucas, uh, Stephen, um, a lot of my regular attendees, uh, King Capo, for coming back. And we'll see you next Wednesday for the localizations tutorial. Um, it's a fun one. All right. Thank you so much again for your time. I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream now. I'll keep the chat running a few more minutes. And uh, please don't forget to uh, offer suggestions too. You can send me an email if there's something you'd like to see from the live stream. Um, send me an email and I'll be sure to add that into our presentation. Take care. Bye-bye.